Chapter 851 Commitment Part 1 The spheres formed a six-point golden star that took away Visa's magic and pinned her in mid-air as if time had stopped for her. It was the perfect form of Silverwing's hexagram which employed spirit magic as well. Spirit magic carried the mana and the willpower of its awakened caster, allowing Malaya to conjure an array in a matter of seconds instead of minutes. Also, spirit magic gave the magical formation a physical manifestation, so that while the elements restricted the liquor's blood core the green energy trapped her body. Without her hands, Visa had no way to cast more spells. The undead tried to unleash the power of the artifacts she wore, but the containment field turned them against her and since they weren't fueled by her mana but by their own pseudo cores, Visa only ended up harming herself. Nice trick, Empress. The lick was burning in humiliation, feeling helpless like a child in front of an adult, but she wouldn't give her enemy any satisfaction. One more defeat was nothing compared to the magical wonders she had witnessed. Not only the Empress tactic had opened her eyes about the true potential of mixed arrays, but it had also shown her enough spirit magic to enlighten the Lick about the true nature of awakening. Even the loss of her army was a small thing if it led to infinite power to complement her already eternal life. Visa was sure that once she got back to her lab, she would achieve both infinity and eternity, something that in due time would make her akin to a god, if not even a to a guardian. I've learned a lot from you. The next time we met, I'll make sure to show you my gratitude. Visa's skeletal figure had most of her face intact and it was now distorted into a cruel grimace. A licker's appearance depended solely on their whims. They could appear as alive, undead, or any shade in between. Visa liked the sound of her own voice, so she preferred to keep her old human appearance. It saved her the trouble from relearning how to draw runes with bone hands. There will be no next time. Malaya clenched her fist, making Silverwing's hexagram shrink to the point that the six spheres overlapped completely. The resulting cage trapped the lick within its boundaries and ravaged her physical form at the same time. The Empress took a purple flask out of her omni pocket and placed her thumb on its cork. Visa withstood the elemental onslaught without emitting a sound. She couldn't feel pain, and even if she could, Malaya's words were bothering her. Once the liquor's vessel was hanging by a thread, the Empress dispelled the array and opened the flask. A stream of white origin flames destroyed Visa's physical form, forcing her mind to go back to her phylactery to be born anew. Unluckily for her, the white flame stuck to her, burning at her conscience. Visa felt pain for the first time since she had achieved lichhood, but it wasn't pain that worried her. It was the white fire trail that she was leaving behind, which betrayed her movements and the position of her phylactery. Visa couldn't keep her mind from rejoining with her missing half, no matter how much she tried. Milea had not moved the lick away because she was determined to end their fight once and for all. No matter how strong Lee Gain's origin flames were, they couldn't kill a lick by themselves nor would they last for too long a trip. Milea was certain that the licker's phylactery was bound to be hidden not too far from Dograth. It was the only way Visa had to be both able to protect the fortresses while retaining her full might and get away in the case things went south. Keeping the pace with Visa's mind was impossible since it moved at the speed of light, but the fire trail it left behind lasted long enough for the Empress to walk without losing sight of her prey. It led Milea to a wheat field where only thanks to invigoration was she able to reveal the presence of several powerful arrays surrounding one of the most powerful artifacts she had ever seen. Both the phylactery and the magical formations were invisible to other mystical means of detection, life vision included. Remarkable. I would have never found it in a million years. The phylactery was made out of a white mana crystal, but it had been painted with such a mastery that it looked like a pebble. Hidden amid dozens of similar-looking stones, it was part of a small mound supporting a scarecrow. Milea dispelled the arrays one at a time without triggering any of the traps that Visa had set up at the best of her skill. I wish I could let you live. There is so much that you could teach me, so many artifacts stored in your lab, wherever it is, that could be put to good use. Malaya sighed. But you have slaughtered my people out of boredom, threatened everything that all the magic emperors before me worked so hard to build. Even if it pains me losing all the treasures you possess, I can't possibly trust you. 
Malaya activated her communication amulet, generating a signal that was picked up by all the communication devices in the empire, whether their masters wanted it or not. She publicly executed Visa, shattering the phylactery with a single strike of her sword, Dragon Maw. Let this be a lesson to those who conspire against the empire. No matter how old you are or how strong you think yourselves to be. Struggle as much as you want, only death awaits you. With visas gone, Dograth fell before sunrise. Before the following sunset, the war was over and the Gorgon Empire was restored. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Months had passed since the situation of Laurel had been resolved. Spring had given the three great countries the time they needed to heal from the many scars that the undead invasion had caused during winter, but the situation was far from being solved. The days were getting longer and the nights shorter, leaving little time for the undead to move whereas their hunters were always on the prowl. When summer came, it made it even easier to spot the unwanted guests from the Giera continent. Even the north was dealing with a heat wave and it was impossible for the undead to pretend to have perspiration problems. Lith didn't like his current situation much. There had been no hard missions ever since he had returned to active duty and he had promoted to captain, but that didn't mean that he had lots of free time. Quite the contrary, his final year as a ranger was way busier than he would have expected. Previously, on Lith the Vampire Slayer, he thought while listening to his handler describing to him his latest assignment. For the first time since Lith had started his military service, the Keller region's lords and their citizens were at peace. Unfortunately for him, his workload was more than doubled. During spring and summer, the monster's spawn rate peaked. On top of that, he had to deal with all the undead sightings that were reported to him. Local constables could deal with a single vagrant creature, but they were powerless against carders of powerful entities. Chapter 852 Commitment Part 2 Lith had to tend to all villages and cities that didn't have a gate, forcing him to travel non-stop. Leaves and discharges had been suspended until the situation was stabilized, preventing him from returning to the Lost Academy of Huriel or spending quality time with anyone but Solus. Not even the recent royal decree that assigned three rangers to each region had helped to relieve the burden on the law enforcers. Central Command was hoping it was just a hoax but a witness of the attack on the caravan is certain that the assailants had red eyes and long fangs. If not for him, we would still be looking for normal bandits. After all, the Kusha route is one of the most trafficked and the undead were smart enough to never leave survivors after their robberies. Well, 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 this mission must be a phone, because damn if I called it. Lith thought, making Solus laugh. Stop being a smartass and listen to Camula. Solus replied. Mission assignments and daily reports are the only moments you share with each other for months now. Lith's and Camilla's work schedules kept not aligning, making their calls scarce and short. They were both forced to work overtime on a daily basis, to the point that to have dinner together one of them had to defect. Lith actually had a free day from time to time. He pretended to move from one place to another with conventional means while he actually used his tower warp but he had no way to share those moments with Camilla without revealing Solus's existence to her. Please, I could do this blindfolded and with one hand tied behind my back. At this point, I've slain enough bloodsuckers that I could have my own spin-off series. He replied. I'll be there in a couple of days tops. How are things on your end? It could go way better. Camilla sighed. I haven't seen Zinya in months and Arkanenas is more on edge by the day. Her daughter has resumed service only due to the national emergency, but Floria's trial is still ongoing, and her career frozen, which makes the Arkan cranky. Lith was aware that it didn't bode well for Floria. Her trial was supposed to be just a formality, at least according to Tyrus, yet it seemed to be still far from a conclusion. Usually the army would have been unforgiving about discussing personal matters during work hours, but soldiers were people first. Also, until the undead migration was solved, working hours meant whenever they weren't eating or sleeping, so the army gave them some leeway. After a bit of chit-chat, Lith consulted the map of the Griffin Kingdom, being pleasantly surprised by the discovery of the Kusha route being close to the city of Zansha. Sweet. 
I can get there quickly via the local Mana Giza or I could report normally and use the extra time to seek an audience with the local ruler, Zedros the Wyvern. He's a good friend of Faliol and this could be a great opportunity to learn how to control my origin flames. Lith thought. He could allow himself short breaks only in between missions, which had led Lith to not being able to help Celia giving birth, let alone to make any breakthrough in the magical field. The communication amulet was the only link he had with his family and friends. Do we have to? I hoped we could take some time to visit Protector. Solar sighed. We've yet to see the baby and you know that due to their forced isolation Celia could use all the help she can get. I'm sorry, but a courtesy visit would get us nowhere, whereas deepening our relationship with Zedros can help us in the long run. If we want to get the awakened runts off our back, we need the Beast's Council's support. Also, improving our forge mastering skills is an opportunity that I can't turn down easily. Faliol showed us that, even though we can use spirit magic and origin flames, we are still stuck with cantrips. I have the gut feeling that both disciplines can greatly improve the success rate of the body-swapping procedure we have learned from the ODI. After all, spirit magic is pure mana, while origin flames are made from my life force. If I learn how to control both of them at will, I will become able to forge master artifacts capable of doing the same. They would replace the pieces of technology that I'm unable to replicate and make the procedure feasible even with my limited resources. Solar sighed again and surrendered to Lyft's logic. There wasn't much they could do in one day anyway, and learning advanced forge mastery was one of their higher priority. Without the ability of engraving runes, things like the adamant forge, the natural treasures he had received from the dryads, and even the bailer's body were all useless. Thanks to his visits to the kingdom's magical libraries, Lith had discovered that a bailer's eyes were powerful ingredients, that if properly treated could bestow the artifact they were embedded into both the power of their corresponding elements and effects similar to dominance. Unfortunately, being they made of organic material, to properly preserve the eye's potency it was necessary a mix of necromancy and runesmithing. Lith had already self-studied the former with great success, but the latter required a teacher. Faliol had told them that she would teach him and, more importantly, that she was willing to exchange knowledge for Lith's flames. After talking with Athung, he had learned that all awakened were willing to perform such trade. Obtaining Zedros's help would mean obtaining the key to the secrets that magical bloodlines usually kept for themselves, saving Lith years, if not decades of research just to reinvent the wheel. On top of that, once he mastered Origin Flames, Lith would have the opportunity to experiment on the Adamant Forge and maybe even craft a powerful artifact. After all, thanks to the flames, he would be able to cleanse the enchantments from the metal and use it anew to craft a superior version every time his knowledge about magic improved. Many birds with one stone. Lith flew to the closest Mana Giza and had Solus assume her tower form. Since there was no end to the assignments he would receive, being fast was pointless. Lith had taken the habit to reset Invigoration's effect between missions so that the rest of his assignments he could use his alleged sleep hours to practice accumulation. In a way, he was glad that his current working frenzy didn't leave him much time to think. His birthday was nearing and with it the end of his military service and his second anniversary with Camilla. Too many things were supposed to change abruptly after his discharge and for the first time in his life, Lith was afraid of commitment. Commitment to Faliol, who was supposed to become his mentor in the advanced disciplines of true magic, commitment to his family, that ever since he had enrolled in the academy had been forced to make do with the crumbs of his free time. Most of all, he was worried about his commitment to Camula. After having gone through thick and thin during the last two years, it was time to man up or break up. Chapter 853 Zedros Part 1 Camilla already knew a lot about Lith's secrets. The next step was to tell her about awakening or at least introduce Solus to her. The longer they stayed together, the more awkward the elephants in the room would become. Just like Floria, Camilla was starting to notice the many things that didn't add up like the secrets and silences that too often were the only answers he could offer to her questions. Well, at least she knows that you are a hybrid, so explaining to her where you disappeared during your apprenticeship with Faliol will be easy. 
Solus's human form had lost most of its luminescence over time. She was worried about it, whereas Lith was certain that it was a good sign. He believed the phenomenon was caused by her form turning from pure energy into flesh and blood. The fact that she was now able to retain her humanoid appearance for a longer period of time backed his theory, yet it made Solus even more worried. Once she would become fully human, the excuses she had exploited to postpone facing her own feelings for Lith would crumble. They were definitely more than friends, but that was it. Also, once it happened, Solus wouldn't be able to delay finding the secrets behind her origin any longer. She had fully devoted herself to Lith for all that time and now she needed to think about herself. To become a proper person, having a physical body is just the first step. Solus thought in a hidden corner of her mind. I need to learn why Master Mina Dion did this to me and what happened to her legacy. It's the only hope I have to find a way to be more than just a magical artifact and get a life of my own. Otherwise I'll always be relegated to the role of Lith's plus one. True, but that's not enough. If she keeps sticking with me, Camilla is bound to meet more and more awakened. Not to mention that even after I complete my apprenticeship, she wouldn't be able to understand why I have to keep traveling, nor how I can freely move around. If she wants to be part of my life, then she must be able to accept you as well. Whatever the future holds, I don't want you to share with me only the bad stuff and keep you hidden like some sort of past mistake I am ashamed of. Lith replied. About that, what if we start with your family? It's really painful for me to know so much about them and yet they don't even know I exist or how much I did for them. Solus said. Lith nodded and went to sleep, nostalgic for the times he could sleep hugging Solus's wisp. Ever since she had got her human body, it was too awkward a situation to continue with their tradition, making him feel as if he was cheating on his girlfriend. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The following day, Lith called Faliul the Hydra to make sure about Zedros's lair location and that she would announce his coming to the Wyvern. Lesser dragons loved to hoard treasures and being mistaken for a thief was the last thing Lith wanted. I'm glad to hear you have decided to become my apprentice. Faliul was in her human form, wearing the sweetest smile Lith had ever seen. It's the only possible course of action. The kingdom is becoming too reliant on my help and I prefer to fly solo. Lith's words made her giggle, yet he preferred not to ask questions and keep their relationship strictly professional. He wasn't aware of Solus's emotional turmoil but had enough of his own to not wish for more trouble. As for Zedros, I'll call him as soon as our call is over. I'm sure he will take a liking to you since you two have so much in common. Wings, origin flames, mastery over the light element. Are you saying that he's a healer as well? No, I'm a healer, whereas he's a light master and a dimensional mage. She shook her head, making her rainbow-colored hair dance under the morning light. For some reason, she was taking a stroll instead of working in her lair as usual. Meaning? Lith asked. That unlike you who just project illusions, he's capable of giving them substance. A light master can achieve with elemental magic almost the same results of spirit magic by consuming a lot less mana. It's a rare and powerful discipline. A greedy light appeared in Lith's eyes while he wondered if the wyvern would be willing to take him in as an apprentice as well. Thaliel would teach him spirit magic and runesmithing, while Zedros could educate Lith about origin flames and hard light constructs. Being part of the Beast's Council was turning out to be the biggest stroke of luck Lith had experienced ever since he had met Solus. Hold your dragons, Wormling. Faliel said, recognizing the look on Lith's face. Zedros is a good friend of mine, but in your place, I wouldn't trust him much. Wyverns are considered to be the upper tier of the lesser dragons, which makes them all the more dangerous. They are prideful, greedy, and arrogant like real dragons yet they are rarely as wise as our common ancestors. Wyverns are desperate to find a way to take the last evolutionary step and become WYOMS. Zedros is no exception. He considers all those who don't belong to the draconic bloodline to be inferior beings, so you better always keep your hybrid form in front of him. Also, he's no forge master, so never mention to him about your skill in the art 
or he'll place an exorbitant price to the smallest of favors. Why someone wielding origin flames wouldn't practice forge mastery? Suddenly Zedro sounded like someone whose ego could barely fit in a football stadium. Because he doesn't need it. Unlike us who are constantly in search of ways to improve our skills, Wyverns only need a few decent weapons and protections to be content. They are apex predators who resort to weapons only when fighting their peers. Old Wyverns like Zedros can sell their flames at a huge price because of the few creatures capable of using origin flames and even fewer of them are capable of controlling them to the extent that a forge master requires. All mags, no matter their race or if they are awakened or not, need origin flames to purify and smelt the most powerful metals, tipping the scale of supply and demand in Zedros's favor. If you consider that it's up to the client to provide materials like adamant or davros and the means to purify them, you can easily understand why he doesn't waste time learning forge mastery. Yeah. If I wasn't forced to find a solution for my reincarnation problem and if I had been born into an awakened bloodline, I would have no need for forge mastering either. Lith nodded. Last, but not least, Zedros is in the second half of his lifespan. This means that he is determined to succeed where everyone else failed and evolve into a dragon. There are bad rumors about him, not to the point of making me suspect he might resort to forbidden magic, but enough to require caution. Your bloodline is unknown, but more draconic than most I've ever seen. If he asks you for blood or anything else, give him a polite but firm rejection. Since I'll introduce you as my disciple, you'll be fine, but otherwise you might find yourself in a pinch if you pique his curiosity. Chapter 854 Zedros Part 2 the memory of Gadolf the Wyvern struck Lith, making him reconsider. Zedros sounded more troublesome by the second, but Lith didn't have much choice left. The Wyvern was an opponent he could face or who at least had to respect his new master. A dragon, instead, would likely treat the both of them like bugs. A sudden childish noise awoke Lith from his brooding, raising even more questions about the Hydra being so chipper. What was that? Sorry, the little one is a real rascal and managed to snatch my amulet. She showed him an infant that couldn't be more than a few months old. I helped Celia during her delivery and it made wonders to break the ice. Sometimes I'd babysit her children to allow her to catch some sleep or go on a date with Ryman. Gods, I had almost forgotten how wonderful hatchlings are. It makes me wish to have a few of my own again. Thank heavens, this explains everything. For a moment I was afraid that Faluel was flirting with me, but she's just swayed by her maternal instincts. Lith inwardly sighed in relief. I heard you already have a companion. With your crack life force you've not long left to live. You should hurry, you know. You're not getting any younger. Faluel repeating Alina's mantra but with much less tact made him almost regret the decision of becoming her apprentice. Almost. Faluel then offered Lith to warp him directly to his destination, but he preferred to study the surroundings instead. If this Zedros is even half as bad as she described him, then it's better to have an escape route and a few contingency plans ready. Lith thought. The first wyvern lived on the top of the Golden Crown Mountain, near the south border of the Keller region. It was a peak so high that it would be always surrounded by clouds that, whenever there was a storm, Thunders would paint its glacier a golden color, giving the mountain its name. Zedros's cave was hidden by such a thick cloud layer that Lith doubted it could be natural. Are you sure you don't want me to come? Solus asked when Lith left her in the middle of the most powerful array at their disposal. Positive. I don't plan on letting Zedros use invigoration on me, but he might still have means of detection able to spot you. Menadian's legacy would give anyone plenty of reason to defy Faluel and I don't want to take risks. Solus's mana sense had perceived a lot of arrays covering the mountain. Some of them were invisible even to their mystic senses and Lith found them only because his paranoia forced him to use invigoration before landing. Zedros seemed the kind of creature that would not leave anything to chance and Lith followed the wyvern's lead, placing his own arrays in the blind spots of the enemy formation. Before assuming his hybrid form, Lith stored most of his equipment inside his pocket dimension. 
He wasn't expecting a fight and his usual display of mystical artifacts might give Zedro's ideas about what to ask in exchange for his help rather than command respect to Lith's scaly host. Lith had no intention of providing a perfect Orichalcum skinwalker armor, nor to give away ruin until Orion was done with the real deal. The mess with Floria had involved her father as well, making it difficult for Orion to receive the authorization to use advanced forge mastering techniques for a grassroots magician like Lith. Judging by Zedros's mastery over Warden magic and Falul's description, I can easily guess from where Gadorf got his shitty attitude. The wyvern only knows that I'm a wormling and that I'm Falul's apprentice, so if I play the dirty poor card, I should be able to avoid unreasonable requests. He thought. Lith even switched Orion's cloaking ring with a medium-tier dimensional ring. An awakened wormling with just a yellow mana core would have aroused Zedros's suspicions and Lith knew that hiding too much of his power might give a bad rather than good first impression. I want a business partner, not to look like a beggar. Lith flew in front of the cave's entrance, discovering that the arrays covering it were so densely packed in energy to be visible to the naked eye. The circular opening in the rock was big enough to accommodate a freight train, making him wonder if Gadolf was incredibly young, a dwarf wyvern, or if his host had simply arranged the house to properly fit its owner's ego. If Zedros's aim was to become a dragon, then he was likely to have built his lair so that he would not be forced to move out after his evolution. I can count at least four different arrays, but they overlap so perfectly that they act as a single entity. I'd better take note of all the unknown runes, just to make sure that this trip doesn't result in a complete waste of time. Lith had just taken a piece of paper and an inkwell out of his pocket dimension when the magical protection covering the entrance split up into four different arrays that disappeared one by one, leaving the passage open. It was only then that Lith did realize the ingenuity behind the wyvern's course of action in protecting his home. Each one of the magical formations had its own purpose and was capable of working alone, but when combined, so did their effects. Unlike the ODI's faulty overlapping arrays, the combined formations didn't obtain a new function, so much as their runic inscriptions were able to fit into each other's blank spaces. It allowed them to combine their powers to increase their versatility by several folds. Until that moment, Lith had only witnessed manners where several different arrays were stacked together to offer protection from different possible sources of harm. The Wyvern's Lair, instead, had few arrays compared to those protecting the Inner's household, but those formations were capable of blocking different kinds of magic according to how and where their runic inscription met. Normal arrays were static in their position and could only be turned on or off, whereas Zedros's occupied all the same magic circles so that based on which of its sections were powered up and those that weren't, they could seal specific elements within their premises. On one hand, that kind of arrays couldn't protect from all the possible threats at the same time like those of the academy, but on the other hand, they required much less maintenance and a far less powerful energy source to be fueled. If I'm right and Zedros controls his house's protections telepathically, this way he can seal off his enemy's best cards at the right time. On top of that, he's the only one who knows how the array's combination affects the elements at a given time. It gives him an edge that not even Life Vision's ability to see arrays can compensate and allows him to fuel all the formations I spotted on my way here. Otherwise not even a crystal mine could sustain that many arrays. Lith thought. It's impolite for a guest to try and steal his host's artworks. It was already rude enough of you to arrive unannounced. Come in, and waste my time no more. A manly voice coming from Lith's back said. Yet there was no one there, making him frown. Chapter 855 Parasite Star Part 1 Lith couldn't spot any surveillance device, so either they were cloaked or he was within the range of the wyvern senses. Now that he was without Solus, his memory alone might not be enough to capture so many complex, unknown runes. Sure, she could access his memories, but just like for the technological blueprints he had studied during college back on Earth, a single blurred area was enough to make the whole thing useless. It was the reason why they always took their time to copy unknown runes like they had done while flying along the mountain. Zedros must be pissed off because I avoided all of his sensing arrays while arriving up here or maybe he helplessly watched me studying his workings. Lith flew inside, noticing that the energy gate reassembled right after his passage. 
The tunnel split into two or more intersections several times, some going upward and others below, making him wonder if the entire mountain wasn't actually hollow. Lith had no problem moving along the maze since upon his arrival only one passage was open while the others were sealed by mystical barriers. The room he entered at the end of the road was nothing like he had pictured in his own mind. After visiting Gadolf's and Faluel's homes, after hearing so many things about a wyvern's greed, Lith would have never expected to find Zedros curled up in a completely bare cave. The first wyvern wasn't much bigger than his late son. If the creature stood on hind legs, Zedros would have been over five, sixteen feet five inches, meters tall, with his long neck taking a quarter of his eight and ending into a long reptile snout as big as a barrel. His tail was about 1.67 meters, 5 feet 6 inches, long, ending with a thick bone spike that resembled the sting of a giant wasp. Two golden membranous wings extended from his forelegs, connecting his little fingers to his hips. The wings were a few shades paler compared to the scales that covered Zedros's upper body and made it shine like a masterfully cut gemstone under the mystical lights illuminating the cave. The raw splendor of the Emperor Beast almost made Lith fail to notice how Zedros's gaze was filled with rage and envy. Almost. Envy because Lith's wings came out of his back, like those of a true dragon. Because the dimensional aura surrounding the wormling was a clear tell that he possessed an omnipocket. A treasure that the wyvern had long coveted and yet it had always eluded him. Most of all, Zedros was envious of the infant's vigorous mana flow that betrayed Lith having a blue core despite his young age, whereas the first wyvern had spent decades to achieve it. Zedros's rage, however, didn't derive from Lith's possessions or talents, but from the fact that the Emperor Beast blamed him for the pitiful state he had been stuck in for over a year. Zedros had yet to fully recover from Tyrus's punch, his punishment for watching a forbidden magic ritual unfold instead of stopping it like his duty as lord of the region required. You've become much stronger from the last time I've seen you Ranger Verhen. Zedros's voice was warm and gentle as if he was a teacher complimenting his dearest pupil, yet his words reeked of mockery. You can drop the act and take your human form if it makes you more comfortable. The wyvern clicked his tongue multiple times wearing a smile that seemed more a pretext to bear the row of pearl white fangs filling his mouth rather than a friendly gesture. Lith didn't move nor replied, more curious about the hostility he felt coming from his host rather than worried. He didn't have Solus with him, but, according to Life Vision, Zedros probably had a weak purple core and a physical prowess way below Lith's. All the glitter of the wyvern scales couldn't hide the fact that his wings were bent at unnatural angles, nor that the Emperor Beast had a bald spot on its abdomen the size of a woman's fist. The area lacked any form of protection, exposing Zedros's soft flesh that pulsed at the rhythm of his breathing. The first wyvern was doing his best to keep the weak spot hidden, but Lith's trained healer's eyes were capable of following all the involuntary spasms in a patient's body. Below all of his bravado lies little substance. I can count at least four cracked bones beside the obvious ones. Lith wasn't willing to challenge such an ancient being in his own home, but prepared a few spells, just to be safe. What do you mean human form? Lith asked, curious to understand the reasons of such unwarranted hostility and what had given him away. Please, I'm not stupid. Zedros's attempt to perform a menacing cackle ended up in violent coughing. Judging by his grimace Lith estimated at least three cracked ribs. Ranger Verhen goes to Zamsha, a wormling appears, and even though Faluel sends her disciple to help his scaly friend, Protector ends up fighting alongside the ranger. To make things even odder, said ranger will coincidentally later become her disciple, creating a divide between the humans and the beasts' council. Also, I've spectated your fight with those pesky awakened back in Zantia and no matter what form you take, your energy signature remains the same. If he knows who I am, all my precautions are for nothing. Me being a healer and a forge master is public knowledge. Lith inwardly cursed. If you were there, why didn't you help? As far as I know, stopping awakened from employing forbidden magic is your duty. Why do you think I am in such a pitiful state? Zedros's voice oozed venom, literally. His saliva sizzled on contact with the stone, each droplet leaving a hole as big as a marble. 
the kingdom's guardian inflicted upon me wounds that can't be healed normally before taking matters into her own hands. Now tell me what you want and then beat it. Lith didn't know what was more shocking. The idea that guardians could make healing magic useless, the wyvern's pettiness, or the revelation that Constable Tyrus was a guardian. Even though Zedros didn't mention her name, she was the only one that could fit the bill. Upon her appearance, she had put an end to the fight and opened a warp gate all by herself. It explained all the oddities surrounding her. Lith spaced out only for a split second before making his request. I'm capable of producing origin flames, but so far all of my attempts to control them failed. I was wondering if you could point me in the right direction. Lith didn't waste time with niceties. The wyvern's behavior made it clear to Lith that he had already overstayed his welcome. Origin flames, you say? Zedros said with a hiss. He had almost forgotten about that, making the reasons why he didn't like Lith increase by one. Why should I? The Emperor Beast almost bit his own tongue as Lith's request finally reached the most rational part of his brain, past all the stress and pain originating from his wounds. Maybe. Zedros said with an amiable smile, making the temperature in the room rise several degrees. As you can see, I'm still wounded. I hear you are a competent healer and I was wondering if there's something you could do about it. Chapter 856 Parasite Star Part 2 Having access to invigoration, most awakened had no need to study healing magic. Being a light master, Zedros had mastered healing magic up to tier 4 before discovering how to create hard light constructs. To him tier 5 light magic was all about combat he had never bothered with body sculpting. Nor could he just call a healer to his home. It would mean to reveal his weakened state and risk to be killed, leaving his treasures ready to be plundered. He didn't receive Lith in his throne room because Zedros didn't feel confident about being able to protect his treasures in the case that Lith took too much a fancy to them and decided to risk his mentor's rage for them. In the wyvern's mind, no dragon would pass on such an opportunity, no matter the consequences, especially a half-breed. Maybe? Lith shrugged. I don't do freebies, though, and I demand my payment regardless of the outcome. The smile disappeared from Zedros' snout, replaced by an annoyed look. You fail at manipulating origin flames because you handle them like you do with magic. Yet they're not alike. Magic is made of mana, whereas our flames are made of life force. The difference is the same between moving a chair and moving your arm. The former needs you to apply your strength on a foreign object, whereas the latter just requires awareness of your own limb. Elemental magic is the ripple effect you produce by emitting your mana, it has no will of its own unless you bestow it upon it. Origin flames are just another part of your body, like an atrophied limb you've forgotten how to use. You can't inject willpower inside of them because they already have one, yours. By attempting to do so, you give the flames conflicting orders that make them unresponsive. It makes sense. How do I fix that? Lith asked. That was your down payment. For a forge master, origin flames are an invaluable tool. I'm not going to take you by the hand and bring you to my level. I might offer you some more insight if you heal me. Zedros's grin returned, but Lith was too focused on his teachings to care about it. Just the implications of those few sentences were enough to make his head spin and him glad to not have brought solace with him. Body sculpting required physical contact and she would have had no way to hide her presence once the treatment began. Fine, let me uphold my part of our bargain. Lith stepped forward and placed his hands on the wyvern's back. Invigoration confirmed his assessment about the Emperor Beast's skills while his Tier 5 spell, Scanner, examined Zedros's life force. Much to his surprise, there were actually two energy signatures residing inside Zedros's body, and what was even more amazing was the fact that the stronger life force wasn't the dominant one. The life force belonging to the wyvern looked like a red sun, the mass of which was slowly getting drained by a nearby white dwarf. The red sun surface was distorted, and there were small threads connecting the two energy cores that made Zedros's life force look like a bridled beast. Lith could hear the melody coming from the Red Star was overwhelmed by that emitted by the White Dwarf to the point of being almost rewritten. Fuck me sideways. I guess Tyrus could have even turned him into a lizard for good if she felt like it. 
Let's hope I don't get her angry by treating this jackass. The moment Litha's scalpel spell touched the white dwarf, the small star shape shifted into a human form. Greetings, healer. Zedros the wyvern has violated the laws of the council and has been punished accordingly. I wished for him to remain bedridden long enough to reflect on his own actions, but I would have never expected that he would wait this long to call for help. Such hubris cannot be condoned, so even though I allow you to treat him if you're capable of such a feat, be ready to stop when I say so, or you will join Zedros in his sufferings. Tyrus's voice and appearance were exactly as Lith remembered, confirming his deduction about the constable's real identity. Lith had never seen such use of healing magic before, so he took his time to understand what Tyrus had done and how to replicate it if he ever needed to. She had left behind a spark of her own life force, about as much as he used to produce a single breath of origin flames. Yet it was strong enough to cripple the wyvern's recovering abilities for over a year, making Lith wonder how long would it last if left untreated. Unlike what Lith would have done in her shoes, Tyrus had inflicted no damage to Zedros's life force, neither temporary nor permanent. Her technique was of such finesse that it left him in awe, wishing he had at his disposal a recording device to study and discuss the phenomenon with Faluel, Solus, and maybe even Quilla. The Guardian had employed light magic so that Zedros's body still knew what was its proper form, yet it had no idea how to achieve it, turning the healing process into a trial and error that made any attempt to speed it up a torture. Lith attempted to restore the Red Sun's shape, but to no avail. The presence of Tyrus's white dwarf was its cause, and removing it was beyond the scope of the bargain. Then, Lith tried to compensate for the effects produced by the foreign life force and allow the wyvern to mend at least most of his wounds. First, he split Scalpel into several tendrils that scanned the white dwarf trying to find some weak point. The mere contact was enough to burn Lith's mana, sending painful spasms through his nervous system as if he had touched a high-voltage wire. Then, he used light magic to attack Tyrus's life force, hoping to weaken it enough to lessen its effects. Avoiding direct contact prevented him from incurring more pain, but it didn't change the situation one bit. Brute force is pointless. If I employ enough strength to affect the Guardian spell, I'll kill Zedros and get in trouble with Faluel. Tyrus said that it's possible to heal this Lizzie, so I just need to change approach. Lith focused his attention on Zedros's life force, studying its shape, color, and the melody it emitted. Unlike humans, Emperor Beast's life forces were raging streams of pure power. It allowed Emperor Beast to shapeshift more easily, but it also made it much harder to apply Tier 5 healing magic to them. The static nature of humans' life force allowed a healer to locate the problem and focus on a single spot, whereas in a Beast's case it was impossible to alter a single stream of life force without affecting their being as a whole. Litha's task was further complicated by Tyrus's spell, which distorted Zedros's life force and in turn the melody it produced. Usually, Lith would use the latter to better understand his patient's life stream and find the best way to fix it. Unfortunately, not only was the melody off-key, but also the white star left by Tyrus's spell emitted its own tune. It distracted Lith and made it difficult for him to notice if his attempts were making Zedros's situation better or worse. Chapter 857 Hard Bargain Part 1 Litha's only option was to sink his own life force with that belonging to his patient and make them resonate. After several attempts, he managed to keep the red sun as a perfect sphere. The melody coming from the wyvern's life force rose in intensity enough for Lith to spot where the alterations that prevented the injuries from mending were. Each time Lith fixed a damaged energy stream, the red sun turned to a brighter color and its melody became clearer. Zedros's life force suddenly turned orange, then yellow, and lastly green. That's enough. Tyrus's voice resounded again in Litha's mind. Zedros will be able to recover on his own in due time. I want him to suffer a bit more so that he realizes how much time he has wasted simply because he was too prideful to bother asking for help. Before Lith could reply, the white dwarf broke his spell and concentration. He found himself covered in sweat, panting as if he had fought for his life. Due to the lack of sunlight, Lith had no idea how much time had passed, but being Zedros fast asleep, the treatment had lasted hours. 
Lith used invigoration again, discovering that now the wyvern's physical prowess was close to his own and that the emperor beast's mana core had turned several shades of purple brighter. Fuck me sideways. Today I've learned a lot, maybe even too much. I would have never expected that a prolonged physical condition could also affect an already developed mana core, otherwise I would have never restored Zedros so much. As if he had heard Litha's thoughts, the wyvern suddenly opened his eyes and took a deep breath. His wings popped back into place and his ribs finally healed, yet the punch mark on his chest was still there, the broken scales refusing to grow back. Finally free from the agony that had tormented him for over a year, Zedros bellowed an unhinged laughter that led Lith to use invigoration on himself and prepare for the worse. At least until the invigorating effects of Litha's newfound body sculpting healing technique completely disappeared and the laughter turned into a violent cough again. You didn't heal me completely. Zedros snarled in a fury. I did the best I could. How many healers do you know that can undo a guardian spell? Lith replied. The truth behind those words made the wyvern take another deep breath to regain his cool, which Lith mistook for a threat. Lith filled his lungs with air as well, to counter the allegedly incoming origin flames with his own. I apologize for my rudeness. What was came out of the Emperor Beast's mouth instead? During the past year, I failed to get a proper night's sleep or even enjoy a single meal, which greatly exacerbated my mood. I hope to be finally back to my peak condition, but I guess this will do. As a sign of appreciation for your patience, I'll give you a few more hints about how to control your origin flames. Zedros's voice was calm and full of gratitude, whereas his mind was filled with malicious plans. I was about to ruin my relationship with Faluel because of a temper tantrum. I've already wasted a year, and until I regain my full mobility, someone like this lesser dragon might be useful. I'll share with him a couple of things he's likely to work out on his own, given time. This way I should gain his trust. He's young, desperate, and there's only so much that Faluel can teach him. Once Ferhen finishes his apprenticeship, he'll be on his own and I'll be able to do whatever I want with him. Best case scenario, I can experiment on the Wormling and use him as a material to reach my next evolutionary step. His hybrid nature should make his draconic essence highly compatible with mine. Worst case scenario, I only need to gain Litha's trust enough to discover where he hides his Omni Pocket and steal it from him once he outlives his usefulness. Yet for now, I have to wait. I can't risk attempting to evolve while I'm in a weakened state, not to mention that Faluel or the Council would kill me. This will take time and patience. Let's put him on a leash by teaching him something about Origin Flames and establishing a business partnership. After all, it will take a while for me to get out of here for good. Zedros thought. While Lith performed body sculpting, the wyvern had exploited the healer's meditative state to use invigoration on him. It had allowed Zedros to discover Litha's hybrid nature and confirm the presence of a dimensional aura typical of an omni-pocket surrounding him. The Emperor Beast could only see it thanks to his mastery over dimensional magic and was in dire need of such a powerful artifact for centuries. While common dimensional items had a fixed internal capacity, an omnipocket storage space was proportional to the power of its master. With all the riches, the artifacts, and the equipment Zedros had amassed inside the Golden Crown Mountain, it would take him so many dimensional items to store everything that he could build a house with them. No matter how powerful the defenses of a place were, a good mage could get past them with enough time and materials. Zedros's experiments required very rare materials, but he couldn't leave his house for too long without incurring the risk of being robbed. There were only two ways an ancient and rich being could freely travel Mogur without worrying about their material possessions. One was having an omni-pocket like Lith or Xenogrush. The other was to entrust their home to someone who would perform the maintenance in their stead and sound the alarm in case of intruders like Scarlet had done with Kala. Omnipockets were very rare and very powerful artifacts that even royal forge masters or ancient bloodlines of forge masters had no idea how to craft. To obtain an omnipocket, a mage had to find it by dumb luck, receive it as part of their family legacy, or bond with a cursed item. Zedros believed to have finally met the first criteria. The problem was that it already had an owner, and the wyvern had no idea where its magical focus was hidden. Just like a phylactery, once imprinted, 
The focus of an Omni Pocket could be left anywhere, and the mage would still be able to access the dimensional storage, no matter the distance separating them. Killing Lith now would mean leaving the focus ready to be imprinted by the first lucky bastard that finds it. I need to slowly gain his trust to not make him aware of my intentions. Zedros thought while starting his explanation. Unlike magic, origin flames cannot be controlled once they are released. Only during the very moment you light their spark can you decide what to destroy, what to purify, and what to ignore. Ignore? Lith echoed. Yes! The wyvern nodded. A true master of origin flames can use them safely, even on themselves. I told you, they're just like a hand. Our flames can be used to caress someone as well as to crush them. Destroying is the easy part. Just spit your flames and you're done. Purifying, instead, requires your flames to affect the entirety of your target at once, both inside and outside. Otherwise, it's only the outside that takes the brunt of the heat and ends up destroyed before the inside can get purified. Let me give a practical example. Chapter 858 Hard Bargain Part 2 Zedros took two metal ingots out of the dimensional ring he wore on his tail. The first was just iron while the second was orichalcum. He then breathed on the former a tiny wisp of a purple flame that consumed the ingot until only a sliver of black liquid was left. That was a destructive breath. Purification is just a side effect since the purest parts of the metal naturally resist the origin flames. The wyvern grieved the lost ingot for a second before continuing, making Lith feel like a spendthrift. Then, Zedros breathed a small jet on the orichalcum ingot, making it shrink while retaining its shape. Lith was amazed seeing that it didn't boil or even turn to liquid, but had just lost about one-fourth of its volume. The orichalcum surface had gone from dull silver to mirror-like substance that reflected every single beam of light that hit its surface. Zedros hesitantly handed it to Lith, snarling more than once. Zedros glared at the wormling with the burning hatred one would expect if the wyvern had caught the healer in the attempt of snatching one of his eggs. I want it back, Zedros said, just in case Lith was blind and dumb. Lith used invigoration, discovering that the mana flow of the purified ingot was two times more powerful than the metal the kingdom had provided him with. The good news is that if I learn how to control my flames, I can turn all the ore I have left into this and double my skinwalker armor's durability. The bad news is that without runes, at my current level I can't even draw the orichalcum's full potential, let alone adamants or davris. Lith thought while handing the ingot back. Ignoring a selective target means that you can safely use origin flames in battle without harming yourself. You can even remove an enchantment from an item without damaging the materials it is made of. Zedro said, Can't you just remove the magical imprint without affecting the enchantments? Lith asked, No, the imprint is part of the enchantment, so you can't remove one without destroying the other. Zedro shook his head. How do I go from destroying to purifying? Such a lesson would be worth much more than the service you have provided me. Zedro said with genuine outrage but I'm sure we can work out a deal. I've been a prisoner of my own home for a year, and I don't know how long will it take for me to return at my full strength. I heard that you are a skilled fighter, and I'm quite the collectionist. If you find any of the following body parts, bring them to me. I will make them worth your while. Zedros handed with a long scroll that listed specific parts from monsters, magical and emperor beasts, and even human mages. Are you interested in buying the ingot? Zedros asked while Lith was checking the items on the list. It's an excellent material for a forge master like you, and by studying it, you could better understand the purification process. How much? Lith asked with a flat tone. He doubted that the wyvern would give away the ingot if he really believed that Lith could use it as a learning tool, yet it was a tempting offer. Solus had already worked miracles in the past, and by comparing the purified ingot with those in their possession, there was no telling what she could discover. Since you're Faluel's apprentice and a fellow dragon, I'll make this a bargain for you. Ten thousand gold coins. Ten thousand. All seven of Litha's eyes opened up in surprise. It's ten times its market value and enough to build a castle. A material that's only twice as good as its smelted version is not worth that much. Also, with a single ingot, I can only make accessories. What good is all the money in the world if you die leaving it unspent? In a life-or-death situation, 
you need all the advantages you can get. 9,990 gold coins. Take it or leave it. Consider it left. Lith would need to work full-time for a year as both a healer and a forge master to make that much. I possess the pelt of a powerful BYK capable of using darkness magic and a clacker queen corpse. Are you interested? Maybe? Show me the goods. Zedros hid his enthusiasm behind a stone face as Lith took out Urta's corpse. There are more holes than fur here, not to mention the organs splattered everywhere. Zedros clicked his tongue. As for the queen, I've never seen a carcass butchered so badly. I can offer you 100 gold coins for the whole package. No problem. Lith put them both back inside the storage space, leaving the wyvern flabbergasted. I can still rise them as greater undead, so their value as servants dwarves your offer. Good luck finding and killing a genius BYK and another emperor beast without upsetting the local lord. Lith walked towards the exit. He had never learned how to bargain, but Celia had taught him how to recognize a bad deal. 150. Zedro said. Yeah, right. Give me the ingot and we'll call it even. Lith replied. The wyvern almost roared in outrage. His eyes were now reduced to two fiery slits brimming with mana. Two hundred gold coins and another tip about origin flames. You want material goods and to pay me with hot air? I'll take your offer only if you accept the sound of my coins as currency. Lith replied while making a gold piece hit the rock surface. If I do it ten thousand more times, do I get the ingot? Many harsh words about the contenders and their respective ancestors' morality in their choice for mating partners were spoken until both parties were satisfied. Lith sold the carcasses in exchange for one-tenth of the ingot. Barely enough to craft a single ring, but plenty to use as a study material. It couldn't have gone any better, Zedros thought. Even finding a Blackford BYK would have taken me a long time, let alone overpowering a whole clacker army just to reach their queen. On top of that, with such a harsh start, once I start growing fond of him, it will make a much bigger impact than if I acted mushy from the back. First, I must earn Litha's respect, then his trust, and only then will I be able to collect my prize. It couldn't have gone any better, Lith thought. Urtu's corpse had no market value, and after I used it to practice necromancy to learn how to regenerate undead tissues, both corpses lost part of their potency as ingredients. Lith kept the list and let the wyvern add his communication rune on Litha's council amulet. Lith had already given up on Zedros teaching him anything about origin flames or hard light constructs. The wyvern knew about his real identity and was bound to ask an ungodly price for his help. Yet that way if Lith found any more parts, they could discuss their price from a distance, saving him the trip if the negotiations failed. Also, Zedros was still the lord of the Keller region, so if Lith had any more troubles with Awakened, he could just wash his hands of them and let the wyvern deal with it. Chapter 859 Hidden Truths Part 1 Once he left the cave, Lith flew at low altitude all the time. He had to retrieve solace before leaving and way. Even if Zedros was still watching at him via his arrays, the wyvern wouldn't notice the pebble jumping into the wormling's hand. As soon as their mind link was restored, Solus jotted down everything Lith remembered about the overlapping arrays and their runes. Lith had focused on keeping a clear picture of them on his way back so the details were still clear in his memories. Only when she was done her task did he share with Solus all of his memories about the meeting with Zedros. So the Lord of the Keller region is a genius warden, a light master, and he even has absolute control over his origin flames. Too bad his character is all over the place. If he wasn't so untrustworthy, he would make a perfect mentor once we're done with Faluel. Lith envied Solus being able to have a conversation with him while she reviewed her notes about the runes and studied the piece of the ingot in their possession at the same time. First, I don't plan on being an apprentice all my life. Second, I wouldn't trust him even if he had welcomed me with a hot pie. People like Faluel are an exception, Everyone else just would try and use me as a means for their ends. Lith thought. I'm certain that Zedros would have refused to teach me tier 5 offensive light magic, just like Minoher did. Divulging an ability that powerful also means losing your monopoly over it. It's the reason why the kingdom is so secretive about royal forge masters and the council about the secret of awakening. Then why did he teach you about origin flames? 
Solus asked, because Faluel asked him to and because I didn't leave him much choice. He needed my help not to remain crippled for years. Also, he just gave me a few crumbs. Zedros knew that I couldn't extort knowledge from him. His body and mana core were weakened, but his protective arrays were all at full power and aimed at me. Not to mention that even if I succeeded, it would have destroyed my relationship with the Beast's Council and with Faluel. He knew that I need their support to protect my family from the human awakened that are out for my blood. Lith replied, What a cunning son of a gun! Solus couldn't believe that Lith had managed to squeeze so much out of an unwinnable scenario. While Solus was still cursing the wyvern's name, Lith wore his cloaking rings and warped away from the Golden Crown Mountain to lose any tail Zedros might have had put on him. Only after several blinks and warps in random direction did Lith feel safe enough to reach the nearest mana geyser and rise his tower. He wasn't supposed to reach Zancha before the following day, and he meant to use all the time he could to study the ingot and put Zedros' teachings to the test. He started by comparing the purified aura calcum with that in his possession. The purified ore was denser, harder, and capable of sustaining a much greater amount of mana before showing signs of stress compared to its just smelted counterpart. Despite the fact that Zedros was no blacksmith or forge master, the origin flames affected both the metal's physical and mystical properties. It's great news since it means that I don't need to understand how the flames interact with physical matter, but only how to make them seep inside their target. Lith used invigoration on both ingots, studying their internal structure as if they were his patients. To his eyes, the effect of the origin flames was akin to what happened to his body after every breakthrough. The main difference was that the weak parts had been straight out destroyed rather than broken down and infused with mana before being regenerated. Aside from that, the final result was identical. The metal refinement hadn't just removed the weak parts so much as those that compromised its integral structure, like those that made the oracalcum brittle or offered resistance to the mana flow. How can you be so sure that Zedros isn't at least a blacksmith? Solus asked. He had no knowledge about body sculpting, hence he can't shapeshift. A wyvern's forearms cannot use tools, and you can't practice anything for hours by only using spirit magic. Lith replied, before focusing on their latest prize. The most amazing thing is that, after being purified, not only is the world energy now evenly spread throughout the metal, but it also builds up from time to time, forming a pseudo-core-like energy mass. When such natural pseudo-core dissipates, the energy it releases tempers the metal. With every cycle, the aura calcum ingot improves both its physical and mystical abilities. It explains why Zalgrish the Lich granted to his adamant forges shape-shifting abilities. Solus said, Being able to alter the shape of the purified metal before the forge mastering process allows him and us as well to study how different forms alter the energy flow. That way we can bond the mana crystals only once we find the perfect shape instead of blindly following blueprints. It should enhance the mana capacity and exponentially increase the quality of the final product. However, it's not all fun in games. I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but I think you've missed a critical point. After every cycle, the built-up mana tempers the metal and improves its properties, but at the same time, the process brings the aura calcum closer to its destruction. Too much tempering breaks even the most powerful blade. Otherwise, Zedros would have already purified all the ingots in his possession and sold the oldest ones at a higher price. Instead, he kept them in their smelted state that has no expiration date. Lith cursed once he realized that Solus was right. It was only a matter of time before the oracalcum became so hard to be so brittle that it would be useless as a crafting material. To think that treacherous son of a Lizzie wanted 10,000 gold coins for the ingot. The only silver lining of this con of a trade is that I learned that purification is the last step before forge mastering. Only giving the metal a stable pseudo-core can stabilize its condition. Sadly, I don't have a single ring worth crafting. Lith and Sola spent the hours before dinner on a rocky and desolate plateau, trying to put into practice Cedros's teachings about origin flames. To not waste precious materials, Lith warped the tower to a mana geyser that fit his bill and only used small stones as study subjects. 
Origin flames couldn't be practiced inside the tower because everything inside of it was part of Solus's body and failing to control the flames could bring her harm. Lith had no idea how to produce small wisps of fire like the wyvern had shown him, so most of the pebbles he breathed upon just evaporated. The luckiest ones were liquefied, yet they didn't show any sign of refinement. I know you hate hearing it from me, but you need to rest. Solus said once all the small stone near the mana geyser were gone. Do you remember how the overuse of origin flames during the fight with the ODI almost crippled your life force? Chapter 860 Hidden Truths Part 2 Until that moment, Solus had managed to make Lith take a break only for lunch. She had been pleasantly surprised to be able to keep her human form for so long, even outside the tower, yet she was worried sick about Litha's mental condition. The longer he remained alone, having only work and research as his companions, the closer he got to his old, single-minded self. She was the only tether he had with sanity, and since they had started to give each other more space due to her being more a woman than just a voice, the chain had got loose. I can go on a little longer, Lith replied. Despite the mild climate of the region, his hybrid body was steaming. The air in his proximity was heated to the point of distorting Solus's vision. No, you can't. You've not reverted to your human form even since you started practicing, not even for eating. Stop this immediately. Solus hugged him from behind, whimpering when her skin touched his scales. The heat they emitted was so strong that the contact would have filled her arms with blisters if she was fully human. The stinging pain hit Solus hard, and their mind link made Lith feel it as it was his own, making him realize that he had truly gone too far. Damn it. This stupid body has no organs, so it doesn't feel pain until it gets heavily damaged. Get off me, Solus. Your dress is burning. Lith wanted to push her away, but his hands were as hot as the rest of his body. Also, if she offered any resistance, he might have made things even worse. I have plenty of dresses inside the tower. She replied, refusing to let go. Before I release you, you must promise me two things. First, no more practice until tomorrow. We don't know what we will face and I don't want to risk losing you because you're exhausted before the mission even started. I don't care what your terms are, I promise. Lith couldn't believe that he was putting one of the people he loved the most through so much pain just because of his stubbornness. Second, no matter what, don't turn around until I say so. Only after saying that last part did Solus let him go and run Stark naked inside the tower to change. She could have created a dress out of her own energy or taken one out of her pocket dimension, but that would have been too fast. She didn't want Lith to notice how bad her burns were nor that the more her energy body lost its glow, the more it gained other features. She had tried to turn into her wisp form, but the attempt had made the pain from her wounds become worse. Why does this kind of stuff always happen at the worst possible moment? Solus thought her golden skin was reddened by the scorching heat it had endured and purple from embarrassment. Until a few days ago, I looked like a doll-shaped glowing stick, and now this? If Master Mina Dion wasn't already dead, I would kill her for not leaving behind an instruction manual about this ridiculous condition of mine. By the time Solus returned, her appearance was back to normal. The Mana Geyser boosted all of her abilities, and being inside the tower provided Solus with unlimited power. She didn't need to cast a single spell to recover. The world energy flowing through her body relieved the pain and allowed her to make a full recovery even before she reached her room. Solus was now wearing a sleeveless knee-length white dress. Her golden hair floated in the air as if she was swimming under the sea rather than flying. Okay, now you can turn around, she said. Lith was still in his hybrid form, partly because he was too worried for Solus to care about himself and partly because he had no idea how his human body would have reacted to such heat in the case it was retained after the transformation. After a few seconds of pure terror about Solus's condition, he had regained his cool, both literally and metaphorically, enough to notice that his scales were able to move by themselves. Their tips would rise and lower rhythmically as if they were breathing. It made Litha's scale armor looser, almost exposing the burning red skin underneath, but at the same time, the scales were sucking the heat back inside his body. 
The process seemed to lower Litha's external temperature and allowed him to recover part of the life force spent. Could it be that the heat is still part of my essence, even after getting mixed with the world energy? Then maybe, his train of thoughts was derailed by Solus's voice. Lith turned around and tried to hug her and make sure she was all right. I'm so sorry, Solus. If only I listened to you, I wouldn't have gotten you hurt. Back off, Buster. I don't want to be barbecued again nor lose another dress. You must literally chill. She said while extending her arms with her palms open in front of his face to keep him away. Lith froze in place at those words. Solus then placed a finger on his forehead. Still too hot to handle. She chuckled while quickly pulling it away. Do you think a bath could help? No clue. She shrugged. We have no idea how a wormling's body reacts to thermal shock. I'd say it's better if we take no risks. Sit down and rest. We can discuss Zedra's teachings while we wait. A wave of her hand made two stone chairs appear from the ground. We should restore the landscape before leaving, otherwise someone might discover our secret spot. Solus pointed at the area that was now devoid of small rocks and at the glazed ground where the origin flames had struck every time Lith had failed to control them. Lith nodded while cursing at the unpredicted annoyance. Judging from my constant failures, I can tell you that the opportunity window to imprint the flames with my will is quite small. At this point, I think that purifying is strictly related to the target ignoring ability Zedros described. To make the flame seep inside a metal, I must become able to make the origin flames ignore it for a split second. An even more crucial step is learning how to produce only a controlled amount of fire. Otherwise, even in the case I succeed at making the flames affect the entirety of the metal at once, the excess energy would consume everything as it happened here. Lith pointed at their surroundings that looked like a volcanic eruption had recently happened. Zedros really is a jerk. Solus used fire vision to constantly check Litha's temperature from a safe distance. Much to her surprise, over time his inner body was getting hotter whereas his scales were getting colder. Unlike Faluel, he spoke in the most obscure possible way while keeping things apparently simple, so that you would need a lot of hints to understand even the basics. If not for his greed, you wouldn't have wasted a day just to learn the proper training phases to control origin flames. First comes quantity, then quality, and only then comes phasing through solid matter. Come again? Quality. Lith said. Yes. I've sorted through your memories and look at what I've found. Solus used their mind link to show him how while the flames Zedros had used to destroy the steel ingot were purple just as still recovering core, those he had employed on the Orichalcum ingot were of a much brighter purple color.